It's a handsome, handsome. All right. I love you, Brad. I, w I wasn't going to keep these sunglasses on, so. You got to see the eyes. <laughs> hello, hello. Oh, so today, this record comes out, 15th. Great record by Joe Satriani. I think you guys have all got your copy. You're in for a treat when you get back. It's fantastic. So, hello, Joe. How you doing? <laughs> what's going on? So, what's your favorite color? My <laughs> favorite color is orange, as you can tell. <laughs> that was easy, right? Yes, You knew exactly. that was coming. Um, I'd like to just start out, obviously, talking about the new record. Uh, you know, a lot of your records have sort of concepts and stuff behind them. Yeah. And this one, I hear, started... Something to do with playing your guitar with your teeth? Yes, yeah. Well, you know, ever since I was a little kid, I was trying to imitate Hendrix, to emulate Hendrix, uh, just be as cool as Hendrix. But I realized I couldn't. But there were a few things I could adopt now and then to impress my friends that didn't take a lot of practice, and that was playing with my teeth. Um, as long as you didn't knock any out or someone didn't, you know, try to push the guitar into your face as you were trying to show off, you know. Um, but it's not good for your teeth, so I wouldn't recommend it. So every once in a while on tour, I'd get into the, you know, the, uh, the fun of the tour, maybe a little bit too much. You're out there for six, seven months, and you start to, uh, you know, some funny habits start to develop. And one of them was you start doing silly things that maybe are against your usual demure nature, you know. And uh, one of them would be that me playing with my teeth. And you get such a reaction from it that it's, it becomes an easy thing to do if you want to get a crowd to, say, yell something or stand up. So I would always feel kind of cheap inside about the whole thing, you know. <laughs> but it was fun because, uh, it, you know, it makes me feel like I'm 14 again. Um, so anyway, at the end of this uh, Unstoppable Momentum tour, I realized that my teeth are beginning to feel funny. And I noticed I'm doing this like six, seven times a night. It's not like once every two weeks, you know, when I'm desperate to impress or something. <laughs> so I was, I was thinking, I'm walking out on stage. Uh, uh, we were in Singapore, and I'm thinking, now, Joe, don't play with your teeth. You don't need to do that. You know, there's, I had family in the audience. I thought I should stand, you know, uh, and, and give a great performance and be respectable. But, of course, ten minutes later, I'm right down there on my knees, <laughs> and it's just, you know, trying to play further and further and I was thinking like well who's making me do this and uh, the daydream after that was well maybe there's an alter ego and and uh, maybe I could even take that further and say I'm struggling with this alter ego like there's an internal struggle and and uh, backstage we were talking about this you imagine like a performer before he goes on he's sitting at his makeup table which I don't have you know that but <laughs> let's say I I did I'd be down there and I'm fixing my hair or whatever. <laughs> and I'm looking in the mirror and I'm saying, you go out there and get him, Joe, you know? And of course, staring back at me is Shockwave Supernova saying, you're gonna go on your knees, you're gonna play with your teeth, you're gonna roll on the ground, you're gonna play as fast as you can. And I thought this would be, this would make a funny movie, but it would also make a great concept for a record if I could write a song uh, about, first of all, that first uh, introduction where the, the, the character, the, um, the alter ego says, I'm real, I'm here, I want to take over, listen to how big I am, how real I am. And that became the title track. And then I thought, well, what if there's a song where he pleads his case as the real Joe is saying, you've got to go, but I want you to evolve into something better. Shockwave is saying, yeah, but look what we've done over the last 30 years. I brought you here. I played the blues. I played all these notes. I played feedback. I fell in love. I played these beautiful songs about things that we imagined, and, uh, and you can't get rid of me. Uh, but then I thought, well, how about by the end of the record, uh, I convince him that it is time to evolve. And those last two songs, uh, Stars Race Across the Sky, um, and Goodbye Supernova really represent him coming to that realization that I'm right and he's ready to evolve into something better. And anyway, if you, if you can get through that whole concept, 
Uh, you could imagine how excited I was to go back and look at all the songs I'd written over the course of the tour and say, these songs would be great. All I have to do is, you know, write the melody for that that evokes that feeling and that story. And that also gave me this huge canvas to jump around not only in styles, but in decades. I, I, could, I could go to the musicians and say, yes, this sounds like 1982. Let's play it like 1982 because there's a reason for it. And... Um, so that is a very long explanation, but actually all that was going on in my mind as I'm walking off stage in Singapore. <laughs> so I heard that you might actually be creating an animated series around this? Uh, well, the animated series has been a parallel project to this thing. And uh, I know there are a bunch of funny coincidences. You know, we have this sci-fi uh, animated series called Crystal Planet. Um, no relation to the album Crystal Planet, other than some music that we use. Um, we have this, uh, the New Horizons mission just arriving at Pluto, sending us pictures, and then this album comes out. A wonderful set of uh, coincidences. But really, that project is something else. That was started by my friend Ned Evett, who's a great guitar player, a fretless player that I think's been in, you guys in Guitar World covered him uh, back in the day. Um, great singer-songwriter, a man of a million voices, really scary. And um, uh, he did a video for uh, a song called Lies and Truths that we took out on tour. And every time we played that from the Unstoppable record, we would show this sci-fi thing. And it was basically all my characters from my 2013 art book. And he had somehow animated them and put them on this planet, which at the time we thought was kind of humorous. But when I would sit back and watch uh, YouTube clips of us doing the song and looking at that, I would think, this is really heavy. This is touching me in some way, and I want to work on it. And I reached out to Ned, and he said, I'm having the same feeling. Uh, we don't know really what we're doing, you know, as far as writing an animated show, but we said, why don't we just do it anyway? You know, <laughs> why, you know who needs qualifications, right? You just, yeah, exactly. If you, have, if you really believe in it, and we had the music, and we had the art, and he had the voices, mm -hmm. so we said, let's start writing a story. If you're a musician, you have to learn how to follow your insanity, right? Your, 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 your quickest good. impulses, you know. That's exactly what it is. Um, so, usually on your uh, records, you do, you know, I, I read your really great book, and if you guys haven't read it, you should definitely read it, Strange Beautiful Music. Thank you. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, sort of almost on every one of your records, there's a concept or there's some underlying theme. And I wondered how important is that to you and, and when, when you go to record a record, does that come before? Is that something that you have to have in your head when you go into that project? Well, you're right. There is always a theme, a concept. Some of them, though, are very light. They might be more musical. Right. Um, let's say with uh, the Extremist record, I was really thinking about stepping back in time to uh, what was being called classic rock. That was sort of like a term that was newly coined at the, the beginning of the 90s. And um, I was thinking, well, it, it almost seemed like society wanted to say goodbye to it already by calling it classic. And I had never, I, I grew up playing it, but I had never been able to celebrate it on any of my previous records. I started off really avant-garde with the first EP and, and just, you know, stayed strange, you know what I mean? So I thought, I, you know, this is music I still love listening to. I should look at my music and see if there is a way to make it more like that so it reflects how I grew up uh, and the music I listened to. Uh, of course, it was extremely out of step, uh, you know, um, because it was the height of, the, of grunge exploding, and I came out with this throwback record that made absolutely no sense at all. And um, But it was a labor of love, actually. But there was a, that was a very light concept, not as heavy uh, as sh uh, Shockwave Supernova. There was no narrative, you know, that you had to follow or, or that I was even suggesting. But it was a musical one that I needed so I could uh, pr appropriately apply my musicianship. Yeah, and also you seem to sort of issue yourself a, a challenge as well when yes, you do yeah. a new record. Um, yes, yeah. What was, say, your challenge on, on the new record, Shockwave, Shockwave Supernova? Sorry. Shockwave. Yeah, see, this is two records in a row that are impossible to pronounce, so <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> Add 
Satriani shockwave. Shockwave shipping so over, yes. Okay. Uh, I'll do this with the mic. So you don't get the <laughs> whistling S. I was actually thinking conceptually before I even convinced myself of the story, you know, which I kept, you know, every other day I'd say, you're crazy, that's crazy, just do a record, you know, forget about it. I was thinking, um, this has got to be the most melodic thing that I've ever done. That's what I wanted to do. So I was pretty hard on myself as I would edit songs, I'd make sure that there weren't passages where there were simply too many notes. If I, it, you know, if there was a solo section, which in an instrumental, very often the solo section is used as like a, a ball of frenzy, you know what I mean? Because you've already played guitar for the minute and a half leading up to it, right? And, and sometimes people want just a ball of frenzy, like you're the guitar player, I'm only listening to you because you do the thing, you know? <laughs> and, and of course, I kind of, rebel against that immediately. Anytime someone tries to put me in a space and says, please do what we asked, I go, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> right, just, yeah. just because I'm not going to do that. So I was thinking, well, you know, there are a lot of these spaces where I just don't feel like that's the right thing to do. Perhaps it's the attitude and the setup that, are, uh, that, that convey the real message. And when the solo comes, maybe you kick back and you, you show another side. You can use if I can get a little bit more like uh, songwriting vibe about this, I'd say you can use the solo section as a bridge. And that way you don't have to put in a bridge. Are you following me on that? Because like if you've got a vocal song, you need a bridge to give you the other side of the story, right? And, and it's usually a softer sell. Sometimes if, the, if your verses are dreamy, the bridge can be something that's pretty outrageous, but it can be two sentences, the breakout part of the story, right? But uh, in the instrumental, it can be very different sometimes because maybe you can't get away with two verses back to back. You have to go intro verse right to the chorus and then somewhere else because you don't have words, yeah. you know, to give a different take on this story you're telling. So then that leads me to the idea that maybe the solo should not be a ball of frenzy. It should not be a self-promotional thing where you say, once again, after 15 records, I can really play the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to show you right now, you know? <laughs> so, because that bothers me if I'm listening to a record and I go, oh, that guy, he's really just trying to hammer me with that, you know? <laughs> so, I, <laughs> well, thank you. So, I would take certain songs and I'd say this, you know, I tell the guys in the studio, this solo here is going to soar. It's going to be a melodic thing. So, you can play tough through it. Whereas on another uh, song or solo, they may go, you know, if you're going to play a lot of notes here, I'll pull it in tight so you've got a really rigid canvas to put your ball of insanity on top of. And so we have to think about that as we're producing the record to make sure that we produce every song right. So, I mean, I'm looking at that too, but I'm thinking this record has to be the most melodic, and I want every solo to have um, an invention in it, a motif, every couple of bars that is a signature uh, that you would say is a melodic signature, right. not just proof again that, yes, he did practice all those hours, <laughs> <laughs> and he's got it together. Well, well, the opening track that we just saw the video of, it's just one cool riff after another. I mean, you don't go to town. It's just like one really memorable monster melodic. So was that, was, would you say that that was the song that um, set the tone for the rest of the record? I didn't know it at the time. I, you know, I, I stuck that title on there, and I thought um, I'll get in trouble if it doesn't turn into something, <laughs> <laughs> because then we have to move a title around, and we never like doing that. Um, I, I think the funniest thing that happened with that song was we wondered if the syncopated riff, which w which is based on a Latin rhythm, would actually go together with this kind of Neil Young chord riff. And um, and so I I played around with that, and I basically Marco came up with something that I thought was very supportive, and yet had a really uh, like a I am Marco Miniman attitude towards it, and I I thought it really needed it because it was repetitive, right. and and John Cunaberti had already said you're only going to do that like twice, right? Like in this all, because <laughs> he knows I can play. He's not impressed by any of that kind of stuff. So I agreed with him, though. Yeah, it, it comes on really cool, and you make your statement, and then you kind of get out of town. So it needed somebody else in there 
with some attitude, not, not just boom, crack, boom, crack. And so he, he added even more syncopation. And that set up, I think, the 12-string idea, which I didn't plan on. Actually, that was me arriving uh, at 25th Street in Oakland um, at the studio one morning. And I said, we're going to do the title track. And uh, John Cunaberti said, Let's, uh, you've got to do it on the 12-string like I heard on the demo. You know? And I think I did one of the verses on, on, uh, on a 12-string. And I said, well, I'm not rehearsed for that at all. I said, I, I think it's got to be on the six string because of, you know, and I gave a bunch of excuses. It was just me, like, trying to get out of it, you know. But he's, he's just looking at me with that look, like, no, it's going to be, you got to do it on the 12 string because it'll sound really massive. And so it took a few hours to work that out because the, I didn't bring the right guitar. So right. I had um, some guitars that were funky, you know, that weren't really fixed up. I had this Epiphone. 12-string, uh, um, uh, 98, I think. Uh, and the first half of the guitar worked well, but after about the ninth fret, it was just, you know, intonation was bad, and, and, the, and the melody requires that you fret and play with the slide on and off through the melody. So then I had a Fender uh, Electric 12 from, from 66. Um, that was good after the ninth fret, but no good. All, <laughs> all clank and noise, you know, up in the first position. So um, we kind of figured this thing out where we comped me doing low stuff on the Epiphone, and then as it got higher, the, uh, the, elect the uh, Fender guitar took over. And then we had uh, these guitars behind sort of ghosting to, to make it. So it took about six guitars to make the thing happen, but we tried to make it sound really dirty and slippery and, and, and big. That was the idea, make it as big as possible. So you had to struggle a little bit, so now you know how the rest of us feel. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah. Well, I can imagine some really great <laughs> slide players like pulling that off really easy. But you know, I was a fan of Johnny Winter when I was growing up, and he played crazy slide, you know. And and I think that probably scared me to you know I, that I'd say oh, I just put the slide away and just bring it out for special occasions. But I do love playing slide. Well, let's uh, uh, we're going to come back to talking about uh, Shockwave Supernova, and uh, we're going to take a little hop, skip, and jump. Uh, through your career. <laughs> this is your life, Joe Satriani. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to go back, you know, to the beginning. Um, I was wondering as a kid, were you uh, an obsessive looking for a compulsion? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You can ask my sister, she's back there. Marion, was I, obs what was I? I <laughs> <laughs> an obsessive looking for a compulsion. Uh, she never called me that, but uh, okay. perhaps. <laughs> No, she, she reminds me uh, very often that I was crazy about practicing. Once I started practicing, I kept going. And, and uh, I'd get up really just bent out of shape if I missed my whatever three hours a day or something like that. But, I mean, that was really, I think, starting at age 14. Yeah. So. But, but your, your initial inspiration was Jimi Hendrix. Can it was, Can you tell yeah. a little bit about that? Well, I started um, as a drummer, and, and my original idea was to make as much noise as possible. I think that was purely it, although I was like really into Ringo Starr and Charlie Watts, uh, um, the drummer in, in The Rascals, Dino Danelli, I think his name was, yeah. Just any drummer that had flair and looked really cool, I thought that's what I want to do. Um, but drumming was hard, and I noticed after a few years of taking lessons that I just wasn't getting good like I would get good at other things that I was learning as a young kid and I thought well you know maybe I just suck it's just like it's never really gonna happen <laughs> you know it's like when you you love a sport and you try a sport and you go this is not the sport for me you know so um, during that time uh, my older sisters were were celebrating all that great music in the 60s and uh, my older brother as well and I just sort of would receive all of that coolness that would just sort of trickle down. And that's how I got into all of those artists starting, I guess, around 66 and on. It became really cool for electric guitar. And um, that's how I got into Hendrix. And so I was a real Hendrix nut uh, from his first record right up until the day that he died. But it was the day that he died that I decided I'd be a guitar player. Yes. <laughs> I think we have a, bring up the first picture here. Um, uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> over here. Oh, yes. <laughs> There's a young, that, that's, your, that's your first guitar. Would you uh, 
Can you tell us a little bit about that, that yes. baby? It's got a lot of buttons on it. Yes, my sister Carol bought that guitar for me. It was about 120 bucks maybe at uh, Roosevelt Field, some music store. You guys remember that Roosevelt Field, right? When it was uncovered, this is like ancient history. God almighty. And that's um, my bass player's basement. So that's Steve Muller's basement, Car Place, Long Island. Uh, John Riccio's Lafayette Stack. That's what that was. If you, I'm sure you're looking at the amp like, what is yeah, that like, thing? What is that? Yeah. yeah, there was a company called Lafayette. I think they were like a Radio Shack, Radio Shack. outfit, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it sounded pretty good if you turned everything on. I didn't think that they tape. made amps that big at Radio Shack, though. Holy yeah. cow. <laughs> it was very light. I don't, you know, maybe that was the only time he ever let me plug into it. I don't remember. <laughs> John was really good, and he taught me a lot. And, and uh, I was the fourth member of their band. They were a band called Mishwa Khan. That's how they pronounce Mohawkan back then, on Long Island. <laughs> it, <laughs> I know this is a family show, so I can't go into too much detail, but it had something to do with weed. I don't know. <laughs> Not me, of course. Look, I'm so innocent. It, well, it, it's a family show, but it's a weird family, so I don't yeah. know. <laughs> but what's curious about the photo is that I'm holding on to the whammy bar already. I mean, already I'm obsessed with that thing and wanting to do something with it. But um, I, I really did like that guitar. It had a really thin neck on it, which made it easy for the, for the left hand. It had that cool vibrato system, which is not unlike the one that Brian May devised for his own guitar. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and did, those, did those buttons do anything? Yes, they did, yeah. Well, there were <laughs> three single-coil pickups, extremely microphonic, um, and they, they did something, but I don't know what they did. Besides, you know, <laughs> on and off, in, a fa in phase, out of phase. I don't know. Well, what, were, what were, like, a couple of the first tunes? I mean, how did you learn? What were a couple of the first t tunes that you learned? Uh, I think the first songs that I'd learned were songs that I wrote myself because I didn't know any other songs. I didn't know how to figure them out by just listening to the radio. I mean, when I would listen to the radio, I was so fascinated by everything I heard, and I thought, like, there's something wrong with me. Like, how come that sounds great, and when I play it, it sounds completely awful and nothing like what they're doing? <laughs> and I was sort of, you know, in the dark about it. Um, my sister gave me this magic chord sheet must have had about 17 first position chords and that's I was sort of starting out uh, on her guitar acoustic guitar um, before uh, I moved to the electric um, and I think that uh, I've got some early uh, like loose leaf uh, degrading loose leaf pages from some notebook and it's got some weird drawings and funny uh, uh, diagrams of the fretboard and some you know, stories, this is a song about a girl and, you know, lives around the block, that kind of thing, and strum it like this and th that kind of thing. Uh, and that's what I did for months until some, you know, friends at school were like, hey, man, you should learn how to play this. And so slowly it was, it was a lot of Black Sabbath and, and uh, Zeppelin and Stones and stuff like that. That's what we played. Right, right. James Gang. We did a lot of James Gang. Actually, from the influence of John Riccio, he was really into... Uh, James Gang and uh, Combo Pie, uh, what else did we do? A Jefferson Airplane. Um, so I learned a lot about that just by hanging out with John and jamming with him. The bomber. Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> great stuff. We great had a great time. Um, so from uh, what I understand, too, is that uh, you, had a, you had a high school teacher that really... Um, sort of changed things for you, named Bill Westcott. Bill Westcott, yeah. We have a so picture you going to show that picture? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so what did he teach you? <laughs> he was uh, what did he teach advising you and how did it me on, uh, you know, style. He was my style advisor, as you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very Peter, Peter Tork thing going on right there. I don't... When I see pictures like that, I, I, I think, like, why did he even spend any, a moment's time on me, <laughs> even caring about what I was thinking? That was part of the just wonderful, uh, you know, the, the, his attitude towards kids was really great. He, I think he was on his way to be a concert pianist, and somehow he wound up at Car Place Public High School. 
uh, teaching kids who most of the time look like they, just, they wanted to kill him. And, um, <laughs> but uh, a bunch of kids, I had a, a couple of classmates that were really talented. There's only about three of us in the advanced theory class. And, uh, and my young student, Steve Vai at the time, maybe 12, 13 years old, um, or maybe even younger at the time, was also uh, starting in his class as well. And Bill was one of those uh, wonderful uh, teachers, super smart, great piano player, who would take the time to sit you down at the piano and say, play this and play this and listen to how that's different. There's a name for it, and you can do it. Don't, don't be afraid of the name. You know, it's, they're just names. It's just music, and look at it. And, you know, he taught us to uh, read and write music, to, to, uh, to sight sing. Um, he t we, we had to, oh, back then, the state of New York had a board of regents. I don't think they have that anymore, do they, for, for public schools? So we were tested by the state, right, twice a year or something like that. So it was serious. Even though it was public high school, it was, it was serious music. And we, by the end of the year, each year, we were, we were submitting a symphony and a cantata and a, you know, this and the that. And, theme and variations, doing figured bass, learning about basically 400 years of Western music. And I would go home and I'd take these formulas that I would learn from, from Bill about modes and things like that, and I would write them out on flashcards and uh, try to memorize them and turn them into guitar music somehow. And uh, it, it, it really, he provided the keys to unlock music that was inside of me that I couldn't figure out how to get on the fretboard. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that it was that sort of education that also differentiated you when you were first coming up from many other guitar players because you were thinking of it from a more theoretical background. I mean, do you, yeah. do you feel that? Absolutely, yeah. I couldn't play, I think, as well um, as uh, a lot of my friends and competitors on like the Battle of the Bands scene across Long Island. And I often wondered where they learned the licks, they all kind of knew all these licks that I would hear on Zeppelin records uh, and, and records like that. And, but my fingers just never did that because no one showed me. But I had this other thing that was more musical, perhaps. So the struggle was always to try to catch up and figure out, like, but where are they getting that thing? I had this thing coming from Bill, the real music thing. But the, the finger thing, unless you have a teacher, you've just got to go find it. And it was a different world back then. Um, you know, rock and roll music was, you had to go find it somewhere. You know what I mean? It wasn't on your phone or your computer or... or there weren't a, transcriptions in Guitar World or anything right, like yeah, that. Yeah. You know, so you had to figure it out. It, it yeah. did make it difficult. Um, but it was, it was fun, though. I mean, the hunting part was fun. And when you found a lick, it was magical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you... Uh, you became a teacher yourself uh, while you were making ends meet uh, while you were coming up before your first records. Yeah. And I was wondering what that experience meant for you. What did you get out of that? Did, you, did that help shape you? I think so. Um, it was fun to just uh, be taken seriously for something that most people always yelled at you for. <laughs> you know, There's a lot of turn that down or don't do that here. That you, yeah, don't do that here. There's a lot of that you encounter. Um, uh, but all of a sudden, you've got your, your peers from school, and most of the students were kids from school who'd seen me play at a high school dance or something, and they were so eager to learn how to play. And for them, I was that guy that knew where the fingers went. And uh, so it was kind of exciting for me just to to realize that there was something happening and we had a place to exchange. Uh, the other thing that was really eye-opening that I thought was a great lesson very early on was to see young kids come in with better facility in certain areas of musicianship. Uh, the perfect example was Steve I coming to my house, having been a young accordion player and having a guitar with no strings on it in one hand and pack of strings in the other and saying, you know, can you teach me how to play guitar? There he is. <laughs> and, you know, after a couple of lessons, he used to take lessons with a friend of his, a guy named Frank. And uh, Frank was more like me. He was, you know, he was in it for the long haul. He's gonna, it was going to take a while. But uh, Steve would always come back 
and he would just have the stuff down no matter what I showed him. And, and he had a gift, and, and you could tell from this, this young kid with a lanky body that he was going to be big, and his hands were going to be big, and everything was going to come easy. And I thought, wow, that really, that really happens. Teachers see that. They see a brilliant student walk in, or, some, uh, or if you're a coach of a, a sports team, you see a very gifted athletic person just walk in the door, and you go, wow, that person's got a future. And I realized that's what Bill had seen in all of us as he looked at the students, and that's why he would spend more time with us, because he thought, this kid's got an ear, he's got a heart for music, he's got a brain, you know, that can, that can handle these concepts. Uh, and that was, it was a good dose of humility, and there's not a lot of that going around when you're a teenager, <laughs> right? You yeah. just think you're the greatest thing ever, indestructible, <laughs> and everything's going to be great, and, but so it was great, and Steve was such a sweetheart, and so... You know, the lessons were so exciting. I was just like one step ahead of him, just barely one step ahead. <laughs> and then in the blink of an eye, I wasn't, and we were just sort of doing things together, you know, after yeah. a couple of years. That's kind of like what it was. Yeah. Uh, but we, uh, we, we forged a bond that, uh, uh, that has lasted today, you know. But we both, we all go back to those classes with Bill Westcott. Yeah, I was sort of wondering why you never did a... a a record with Steve, you know, your guys own Chester and Lester sort of uh, right. thing, you know? Uh, we're so different. It's just, it's crazy. Yeah. We are so different in so many ways. And uh, I, I could see us sitting down uh, and arguing over how to start, like, for <laughs> years. You know, we're not the arguing type, but I could just see us, you know, Steve saying, well, I've got this idea, Joe. And I go, oh, well, I got an idea, too, you know? <laughs> So for now, we we know that without having to say it, we can tell just by looking <laughs> at each other. This is not going to end well. This is not going to end. No, <laughs> we're going to work on this thing for twenty yeah. years, and we won't be happy. And uh, we we both like to keep uh, extensive notes about projects we want to do. And but we've played live a lot, and we've done a lot of live records together. So so maybe like when it's Chester, maybe when you guys are seventy or eighty, then well, you, you, I don't know about you that. both settle down a little. I bit, keep threatening. You know? I figured, you know, I came up with this idea a couple of years ago. I said, you know, what if I sent you something that I'm having a problem with, and I do, I don't give you any direction, and there's no time frame, and you just kick it back to me at some point with your ideas, and you know, just go easy on the time signatures, you know. <laughs> And we'll see what happens. So I'm still thinking that's a good idea. Um, <clears throat> you had, I mean, could, could you usually spot the special ones? You've had a, a lot of students that went on to incredible success. Yeah. Kirk Hammett uh, from Metallica, right there. And yeah, there he is. Alex Skolnick. Yeah, backstage San Francisco. Um, there were special guys, yeah, I have to say, but in different ways. What? What would you? What would be the single most important bit of advice you'd just give to any guitar player? Hmm. That's a tough one right there. I can't believe he just asked me that, right? <laughs> well, Brad, let me tell you. <laughs> Kid, quit while that, you're ahead. That's going to cost you. No, that's going to cost you a lot of money. Um, you know, it's... Uh, the, the, one of the... Let's say there's a practical advice and then there's non-practical advice, right? The, the non-practical advice, but it's so important, is to only play what you feel. That's extremely important. It's a bit esoteric, though. So, when, you know, when someone stops you on the street and says, well, you know, my band's having a hard time or whatever, and uh, my hand hurts, what should I do? And you say, hey, you only play what you feel. It's like, well, thanks a lot, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> I could have thought of that myself, you know. But it's kind of like a Zen lesson or something like that. That was something that Lenny Tristano taught me. He's, but it was wrapped up in a lot of other lessons, which had to do with if you knew the note was wrong, why did you play it? Or if you, if you weren't ready to play the right note, then you shouldn't have played it. And never play what you think you should have, could have, or would have played. Only play what you want to play. And when you really dwell on that, you, you realize, wow, am I just like spitting stuff out that I've copied from everybody else? Like, he did it, he's cool, watch me do it, but is that really a musical statement? Or am I just like a ball of nervous twitches that can move my fingers around? And he was very, you know, Lenny was very sensitive to that. He, if he saw that in you, he would want to deprogram you immediately. 
And he would do it with language by making you look inward again. So um, I find that advice, as esoteric and non-useful as it is, being very powerful, once it's in your brain, you'll never forget it. Next time you're on stage, and you, you know you're going to think, what, you know, who am I playing for? What am I trying to accomplish? Am I focused on the gig? Am I thinking about what I'm going to eat afterwards? Or I gotta, when is this ending? Because I've got to drive you know, four hours home or something. A lot of things run through our minds when we start to drift. But if you can just think, i, I got to play what I want to play, it, you, and you do that, you will be able to endure the rough times a lot better because you can always finish the gig saying, I played what I wanted to play. I may be here today at this club that I don't want to be at or, 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 or I'm jamming in my bedroom and, and no one's listening, but at least I played what I wanted to play. And it's, it's a deep lesson. The, the other one is always, I would say, don't play if you're in pain. Your, your hands, you know, if your wrist hurts, your fingers, not your tips, but I mean your joints, you got to stop. It's, and there's so much more work you can do in your head that is worth so much more to push your musicianship forward than that exercise or whatever it is that's given you a pain. And, and, uh, and, and you really don't need to. Physically, I would say an hour a day is enough for all that kind of stuff because no one will, I don't think anyone will ever buy a ticket to watch you run through all the exercises that you know we all have been subject to as beginners. So why bother spending all those hours doing it? Imagine if there was a chart at the end of your life and Brad's there and he's saying, well, congratulations, Joe. <laughs> By the way, you've spent 4,000 hours playing the chromatic exercise. Congratulations, got you nowhere, you know? So it's important that we learn how to budget our time and our energy. And you know, your, your, your hand your hands, your joints, that's a resource, and, and it's, it's finite. Things happen to your hands during normal life and, and every other part of your body, but that's actually what we use to play the guitar. So uh, you got to think about it like you would think about maintaining your strings or the tubes in your amp or whatever. It, you don't just turn them on and they always work, so you'd want to maintain it, right? So it makes sense that you would do that. And, and so don't, don't trip on those exercises. They're, they're not really necessary. Music is important. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> that's good advice. Too part of, yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, so when you first started recording, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of a, a, a common thing these days that, you know, people can release guitar instrumental records, but it was very... A, a super rare thing when you recorded your first uh, self-titled EP and uh, Not of This Earth. Um, what 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 made you what what possessed you to 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 make that leap to try to do this? I was love that shock word. Waves? Possessed. <laughs> what possessed. possessed me? I was possessed. Was that the shockwave supernova no, that's funny. pushing you into the? Uh, you know, I did. I I produced a record for the band Possessed. So it's funny you should say that. It's like, I remember that. That was that was Larry Lalonde's first band. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, what possessed me to do that? I, you know, um, the backstory on that, on putting putting out the very first EP, um, all guitar, no drums, keyboards, bass, or anything like that. Lots of tools banging on the pickups and the strings and creating odd sounding rhythm tracks. Um, that was really a reaction to five years of just working so hard trying to get my band, The Squares, some kind of success. Um, Jeff Campitelli was a drummer in that band, and Andy Milton was our lead singer and bass player. And we rehearsed like all the time, like, I don't know, five, six nights a week, and we would play as many club shows as we could. But we kind of got nowhere, and it was, you know, it was rough. And I started to think, you know, the stuff that I do at home for personal musical growth is actually more exciting to me than this stuff that sounds very professional and sounds like what's happening in the clubs and on television, on the radio. Uh, so I thought, well, when the, when the band was having this little uh, vacation, uh, I decided I'm going to just, well, this is such a hard story to tell short, you know, a short version of it. We rehearsed in this warehouse in, in uh, downtown Berkeley 
right next to a company called Nolo Press, and they made how-to books with tear-out sheets. I don't know if anybody knows that company. So, you know, how to start a business, um, how to grow an organic farm, how to get divorced, how to do this, all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and so we'd be out there, you know, uh, having a smoke in between uh, rehearsal sessions, and we'd be next to the dumpster, and this thing would be overflowing with the books that had some sort of errors in them. And I took one home that said how to start a business, and I thought, I'm going to read this on the vacation. And I got the crazy idea. I was possessed, as you said, to fill out these forms and start a publishing company and a record company. And I called a friend and said, I want to record a record, and it's going to be really weird. And I want to do it just because in a couple of weeks, I want to have a record that's got a label and a publishing company, and we can hold it in our hands just to see if I can do it. And, and that was really the reason behind it. And, and we did make the strangest record ever that most people played at 33 R and a third RPM. Actually, it was cut at 45. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think I printed it big enough on the label to remind people to play it at the higher speed. I know you're thinking, speed? What's he talking about? Turntables, yes. Vinyl. Uh, so... Um, that was interesting. A lot of people said, Matt, record's slow, man. I dig it. <laughs> it's really slow. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that led me to, anyway, there was a story that I tell in the book, and I was going to a rehearsal. Uh, my friend uh, and bass player, Bobby Vega, who's on the new record, uh, playing on a song, he said to me, hey, you're, you're famous. Your, your record, some record you put out is reviewed. And I looked at it, and I thought, that's, who I am. I'm not this guy, you know, formerly of the squares, yet in another band in a basement in San Francisco trying to be very professional. I'm this really strange avant-garde guy that just put out his own record at the wrong speed, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just to confuse everybody. And I, I was very excited about it. And so that, that feeling of being possessed really turned to excitement. And I started to think, okay, I got to make a real record. I got to press it at the right speed and uh, I'm gonna have drums and real bass guitars and everything, and that was not of this earth. And, and so that was also recorded on my label, Rubina Records, and uh, took maybe about a year and a half before it got released on Relativity. It, yeah, quite a story, yeah. And I should add that I paid for the record on a credit card that got sent to me in the mail, which I don't recommend to anybody ever doing. <laughs> 19.7% or something like that. That's, yeah, 1985. Those <laughs> no, the, the Greg Kin gig saved me, and I was able to, the very last day of before going to a collection agency, I could finally pay that off. But, yeah, that was cutting it close. <laughs> very close. So uh, you, you released Not of This Earth, and it was a very... Uh it's a very progressive and different kind of record. I mean, you you weren't playing through amps, you were playing through Rockman, you were using yeah. drum machines. Yeah. I mean, yeah. were you at that time thinking, okay, I'm going to do this, and I want to, I, I, I want to do something futuristic. I don't want to really pay homage to the past. I want to create something unique and of this time, not imitating the guitarists from the 60s, the 70s. Exactly, yeah. Well, there were two uh, feelings that, I w that were really strong in me at the time. I was saying, I'm not gonna plug into my two Marshall half stacks again. I'm not going to try to jump into the ring with this circus that, that really had sprung up around guitar players. There were a lot of hairy guitar players playing with a lot of distortion. It was all sort of, like pseudo classical, there's a lot of harmonic minor stuff, and I thought this is terrible. I mean, the guitar playing was good, but there was no care to the song. You know what I mean? They were just, they were. It was, it was sort of like a club, and no one had really thought about the mantra of the club. They just thought this is a cool club. I'm just gonna do it. So I'd hear these songs, and I think that's definitely the wrong chord pro progression for what the singer is singing, or the scale is just like really that scale about a song. <laughs> That's about that, and I, there was enthusiasm, and like I said, great, great playing, but I thought, this, this is not me, I'm not gonna do it, and uh, I thought, I'm, I'm gonna show people 
that you can take some very unusual chords and you can still tell a very interesting story, but there is, a, there is something to putting the right scale together with the right chords. And it doesn't have to be a lot of notes. It could be two bass notes, three chords for the entire song, and watch what I can do when I just drop in with these different phrases here and there. And that became the idea of this guy, not of this earth, who comes and plays this weird sounding kind of stuff. Now, there is another backstory to it. There's always a backstory, right? Yeah, yeah. So the backstory is, is that uh, back on Long Island, my friends and I, when we had a band once, uh, we, we had some gig where we had to do Beatles songs, uh, and we would rehearse at Michael Arculio's house, like, forever. And every time we take a break, we go down to his kitchen, and his mom would have sandwiches for us, and we'd turn on the TV back when there was, whatever, five channels on Long Island. And... Uh, <laughs> I know, it's crazy, right? I'm like 180 <laughs> years old or something. <laughs> but they would, play this, they would play this movie all the time, Not of This Earth, this really bad movie from 1958. Black and white, <laughs> chase scenes repeated like six times, just you know, with more dramatic music. And so we memorized the entire movie. We knew every line from, from the movie. And, uh, and it was about a guy with sunglasses, you know, who, who would show up, right? And he would do that to you, and you would hear somebody like crunching a potato chip bag in the background, like expensive Foley, you know? And their blood would be sucked out and transmitted to some other planet. You know, that was basically the idea of the movie. And we love this movie. And so I find myself out in California, I'm doing this record. I've got a sense of humor, I think, and I'm, and I'm, I'm wondering, where's Mike and Danny, and where are all those guys? So I thought, I know what I'll do. When I, because it's my record company, right? I'm the president. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> so, so I figured, well, I'll, I'll call the album Not of This Earth. They'll definitely see it. They'll get a good laugh. They'll see the address, <laughs> which was my apartment. <laughs> and they'll write to me. And I thought, this is great. I, was, I mean, those were my aspirations for the album. I wasn't thinking a platinum record or something like that. I was thinking, I'm going to send a message. I bet this is going to get all the way back to Long Island somehow. So, but uh, no, it didn't. I, I basically, I started like mailing that record around all over the world to independent record shops and, and stuff. But it gave me courage, which I think was the important thing. It didn't, you know, it was a loss. It was a total washout as far as uh, the business goes. Uh, no fault of the Nolo Press book. They did write a good book. I just, my accounting was a little <laughs> fuzzy. Uh, but it did work because it gave me courage to, to be that other guy at that moment when Bobby Vega walked in and said, hey, look, you're famous. But he knew me as Joe, but it was like, who's that guy? Avant-garde guitarist with his first solo record out. He was like, look at you. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's me. Yeah, that's, me. that's me. See you later. Going to go make another album, you know got places to go. So I've got about 340 more questions, but I'm being told that I've got to <laughs> wrap up this segment of it. <laughs> we'll have to do another so, one. Here so, uh, but uh, anyways, one thing that I was thinking about is, so when you go back, and I know that you recently uh, remastered your whole catalog, and you went back and listened to that guy that was playing on Not of This Earth, <laughs> and you listened to, you know, you're recording this record, what are the big differences that you see between that guy then and this guy now? Is there, a, is there a difference in your playing? Is there a difference in attitude? Well, there has to be, but I've got to be the worst person to ask. Uh, I'm kind of immune to like, noticing my own style. I hear the aspirations, you know? I remember the hard work and all the things that we didn't get to do. Um, it's tough when you're when you're you've got dreams that are multi-track and you've only got a few tracks to do something on, uh, as it was back then, all those records were tape. Um, the project really was elevated, um, as my whole catalog has been, by John Cunaberti. He's the mastering engineer with the golden set of ears, uh, and he knows me since you know late 79 or early 80, so he's seen me play a million times. He was the Square's live sound engineer, he was my first engineer in the studio, and then went on to uh, record most of my records. Um, 
and uh, he would be the one to say, absolutely not. We are not, re you know, remixing that. We're not, you're never going to replay that or fix that bad note. It's, that's the way it, it's you. And so we approach the record like, let's bring back the dynamics to the recordings. Let's remove the anxiety of mastering from all the decades, you know, when this was hip and that was hip and you had to do that for TV or radio. And let's see if we can give uh, the recordings uh, uh, sort of a wake up, a return to what it sounded like to us the day we said, that's the mix, we're done. And if we could have invited all the fans into the studio to listen to these beautiful studio environments, you know, to listen to these recordings in those environments, that would, that would be our goal. And, uh, and so John really, he pioneered that whole thing and he pulled all those records together that were recorded over a very long period of time on a million different machines in so many different rooms with different speakers. It's crazy. So when I, when I listen to it, I, you know, I remember doing that solo at two in the afternoon or four in the morning or making John punch me in a million times on the tape machine because I didn't like something or I liked the way the punch sounded better than playing it well or something like that, you know. I put him through hell. And I should apologize if he's watching right now. <laughs> Sorry, John. <laughs> but, you know, in, in the end, uh, I shouldn't be the one to, to touch those things or to comment. I, I can't. I should, you know, I finish, I give it to the, to the people, and I need to just focus on what I'm writing now. And no, no point looking back. So uh, I'd like to turn this over to the audience and see if there's oh, anybody out there that uh, has a few questions, anything. There we go. Yeah, I got one. Yeah. Uh, thanks. My name's Joey. Hi, Joey. So you talked about being a teacher. You talked about being a student. Um, you've run us through so much. What, what's day one for someone that, you know, wants to get into this and is just kind of overwhelmed by everything? Yeah, it, it is overwhelming, but it's never been uh, anything less. I don't think there's ever been a, a golden age that's been better than the one that's happening right now, uh, to tell you the truth. Uh, it's really up to us as artists to create our own illusion of the golden period. You just say, this is the great period. This is when I do it. And, and don't worry about those external things. Of course, we have to learn about them. I would suggest getting books like This Business of Music. I think it's still put out by Billboard Press, perhaps. Yeah. Um, if you don't know about all the little, you know, cogs and wheels in the music industry, you should just learn it. You're going to read something anyway, so you might as well read that book. No. And, uh, and then, you, and, you know, go to other teachers, go to clinics, go to things like this where, where people or artists are opening up about uh, the, you know, the truth behind uh, their success and failure and uh, take it all in. But don't think that you need, you depend on us. It's yeah, got, it, you it had to, to you threw caution to the wind. I mean, that was the, the, the story behind your success is that it, at some point you just have to go for it, right? Yeah, that's right, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I, 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 I saw something recently where, well, uh, there's this movie that's sort of making the rounds now, um, and it was completely shot on an iPhone. <laughs> and it's being released, you know, it's got a commercial release. And I thought, well, that's brilliant, right? You know, like I don't have a million dollars, but I can, I yeah. have a creativity and I'm gonna put this out one way or the other. Yeah, yeah, well that's good for all of us who love gear, but maybe spend too much time worrying about it, playing with it, thinking that if I only had that one box, people would like me, you know? If I can, in convincing your family, look, we got to spend another eight grand on this guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'll never be famous. Uh, yeah, I mean, it runs, that's just the neurosis of, of loving a gear and stuff like that. But yeah, you know, if we had, uh, you know, if, if I, in my pocket, I said, look, I've got this, uh, you know, rolled up piece of uh, birch bark and it's got a recording of Mozart, like, on it. You'd want to hear it, right? You wouldn't say, oh, man, what's the resolution on that thing? <laughs> you know? Are you playing that on the, you know, the 2600 birch bark uh, player? Or, <laughs> you know, you'd say, let me hear that, you know? And so people are like that, you know? If, if you've got an unusual recording or you're doing this project, like instead of on an expensive film camera on, a, on an iPhone, 
uh, if the quality of the information is good and it touches somebody's heart, they won't really care. It, it just becomes theirs. That's what people do with music, you know. We, we all do that. We hear a piece of music, we take it into our hearts, it becomes ours, and we use it the way we want, regardless of what the artist or how the artist intended us to use it. And, and certainly we don't care about their struggles in the studio or how many times I mastered it. It's like, who cares? That's the song I put on when I want to celebrate this moment in my life. You know? I mean, I, I, I first heard the Beatles and the Doors on a transistor radio, and it sounded good to me. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Yeah. Yes, so true. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. Hey, Joe, this is Adi. Hi, how uh, you doing? Good. I had a question for you. So with respect to G3, is there like a guitarist that you always wanted to be part of the G3, other than Hendrix, of course? Yes, yeah, Hendrix would be difficult. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Jimmy Page, I think, would be amazing, yes. He's amazing all by himself, but I think I could convince him that he'd be even more amazing uh, on G3. Um, you know, I've asked Jeff Beck and, and Eddie Van Halen almost every time we've gone out. Sometimes we get close. Yeah, you know? Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of them. And uh, G3 is something that is, takes so long to put together that there's sometimes a year and a half where we've got a couple of names penciled in and everybody wants to keep it secret. So it's just one of those things that I keep quiet about it because the, those people who are thinking about throwing their hat in the ring well, don't want us to be, go public with it until they're certain. So, But those guys... I'm almost certain they're always going to keep turning me down, so I guess I can say it. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, I'll keep trying. You hear that, Eddie? I'm going to call you. <laughs> Hi, Joe. I'm Hi. Warren. Hi. How you doing? Good, thanks. Um, just a simple question. What have you been listening to lately, and what about um, it is, you know, if you repeat listening to it, what, what about, what's it making you feel? What about it is making you come back to it or listen to it? Oh, you know, uh, last couple of weeks, it's, uh, it's all been um, uh, Marco Miniman's solo record, crazy. Marco has just, uh, he's got 15 records or 14 solo records out. I never knew that. Every time I, I get together with Marco, I learn something else about his creative life, his other life other than the drummer. Multi-instrumentalist, what he does with harmony is really weird. It is not like what other uh, melodic instrument players will do with chords, and I'm fascinated with it. Um, of course, the Aristocrats' new record is really great. Uh, Guthrie is a scary guitar player, great to listen to. Um, and those guys are just, just, are just all crazy. Um, and of course, uh, Animals as Leaders, they were all a uh, part of these two gigs that we did, one a benefit for our friend Cliff uh, in Los Angeles a few weeks ago, and then they came to the G4 experience and were part of the team that performed and gave clinics to the 200 uh, campers. Um, I couldn't imagine, along with Mike Keneally, you know, uh, just a bunch of guitar players that are so great and yet so completely different than me. And I was so fascinated with that. And we were jamming together every night, and it was so much fun to, to, to watch, let's say, uh, Tosin sit there and play The Thrill Is Gone, you know, uh, and when we, and we were in L.A., uh, you know, too much. I'm looking over at Tosin, and he's playing the blues, right? And then uh, after I play something, um, I look over there, and Brendan Small from Death Clock is sitting there, and he's playing the blues. <laughs> and this kind of exchange is really fascinating because these guys are all accomplished musicians. They're very talented in many other artistic areas. Uh, but they're willing to just go for it and step out of their comfort zone and try to play something different. And I love that, you know, I love that in musicians. But those few records that have just come out, uh, Marcos and the Aristocrats, and, uh, and actually, um, uh, I don't know that the title, what's the latest title, Animals as Leaders record, what is it? It's not Weightless, is it? Uh, it could be, uh, but I think that's been out for quite a few months. Uh, um, but I'm sort of having a renaissance with it, you know. Eight strings, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. We have time for two more questions. Okay. Running over there. Yeah. Hey, Joe. Hi. How you doing? I'm Don. I brought my wife from San Francisco just Hel to be Hello. with you tonight. Hello. Great to uh, see you. Kind of an interesting two-part question for you. So we're from San Francisco, heartbed of technology. So I brought with me a time machine. And in a moment, <laughs> I'm going to bring out Jimi Hendrix. 
And we only have 60 minutes, so what one album would you want to have him hear? Oh, play a record for Jimi Hendrix. I, you're going to play one of your albums for him. What do you want him to hear? Oh, I don't know, man. I'd be so afraid he'd listen to a couple of oh, moments. Come on, come on. He'd get right back in the time machine <laughs> and say... No, come on, you have to pick one. <laughs> Where else can we go? <laughs> oh, that'd be so hard, yeah. Come on, just throw one out. I, yeah, wh you know, just anybody's record? No, one of no. yours. Oh, one of mine. Oh, that's even worse. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I probably, I wouldn't do a studio record because th that I'd be too embarrassed, you know, because I, but maybe a live record, maybe live in San Francisco, right? In, okay, in, awesome. In honor of our hometown. Now, I've got yeah. a, I have a small technical glitch, though. Okay. You can't listen to the whole thing. So from that, from that live recording, what one song... Would you love Jimmy to listen to so he gets the essence of you? Wow. This is crazy. Okay. One, one, well, there's this little, maybe it's uh, Cool Number Nine or something like that. I don't know. Yes. Something loose and, and jamming. I think he'd appreciate that, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she's running around. There she goes. There she goes. She's coming around. Hi. Hi. Rachel. I love you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, I've been listening a lot to uh, um, blues also, mm -hmm. and I always thought that you could do a G3 with the blues guys, you know, like now B.B. King is gone, yeah. but Buddy Guy is still here, yeah. and um, uh, Kenny Wayne Shepherd, you know, all those guys are awesome. Yes. You know, and you said Jeff Beck. I just went to see him for the first time in my life. Oh, he's amazing, right? He was, oh. Yeah, yeah. So I say, why don't you do a G3 with some blues, or you do a new record later on with some blues that comes from inside you? Yeah. Because I know you had, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> so, Thank you. Uh, I don't know. You, you tell me. I'm, I, you know, I'm always sort of threatening myself to do that. I'd love to do a blues record. I keep thinking I'm just not old enough. I keep thinking, you know, I was just... I need a couple more tragedies under my belt, you know. Oh, Ken Yuen is not, and you could. Yeah, I, I don't know, because, you know, I, I think um, I first time I really started to hear blues was uh, uh, my brother John playing uh, John Lee Hooker records and, and, and trying to educate me on that stuff. And I was totally blown away. And I remember jamming with those records uh, and listening to my brother play blues harp. And uh, that really ignited that sort of feeling inside of me. But I always thought that, well, you know, if I'm comparing myself to Mississippi Fred McDowell and Muddy Waters and these great blues players, um, I'm just, you know, Joe Satriani from Long Island. <laughs> so... Um, I figure I'll wait a bit on that and get some more experience under my belt. And so I bring it out now and then. I think the new album actually probably has more blues on it than uh, a, a lot of my other records. Um, but for a traditional blues record, that w the, I'd love to do it. I think I'd need about a year to, to really push all the other stuff away from my palette, maybe, and just say, I'm just going to concentrate on this and make sure I got the right gear for it and, and just you know, forget about all those other scales for a while. <laughs> uh, and I'd like to write original music, so that would take some time. I need to get a, a great singer, of course. That would be hard. Instrumental, that's, that would be really hard. <laughs> Come on, you, you got to have somebody sing. Come on, Joe. Blind Melon Supernova. I can hear it now. Oh. <laughs> yes, there you go. There you go. We just got the title. We're on our way. <laughs> we are on our way. There, you always start from a concept. There That's right. Go. Start with the concept. Thank well, you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joe. Really appreciate it. Sharing this is a this is a, a big day. Joe's uh, released new record today. You guys have all got it. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. I thank this man here. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you for sharing. Uh, thank you for sharing your time with us today. Thank Jeff. you. You were wonderful. A big hand for Brad here. And of course, you guys were amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you.